The WCC tournament gets underway tonight. Will we be looking once again at a matchup between Gonzaga and St. Mary's, or could somebody else jump in and spoil the party? You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome into the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by FanDuel. Folks, make every moment more right now. New customers who join today, you'll get $150 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. So visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Well, thrilled to be joined, as always, by my friend and the host of the unofficial WCC Hoops podcast, Zach Farmer. Zach is here to help us preview the WCC tournament, talk about what might shake out over the next couple of days, whether we are going to ultimately end up seeing another matchup between Gonzaga and St. Mary's. It's rare that we don't. When we get to the end of the WCC tournament, we're going to talk about what might happen up to that point. But Zach, I want to start talking about the WCC awards, because as you noted, as you have seen, the discourse on Gonzaga Twitter in particular has been rather negative around how these WCC Just awards shook out. Not a single award goes to a Gonzaga player or coach out of the six major awards. They do end up getting three players on the first team. Nolan Hickman is left off the first team in favor of the second team. Lots of talk in particular about the Newcomer of the Year Award going to Jonathan Mobo rather than Graham E.K. or Ryan Nemhard. Augustus Marcelonis obviously wins the Player of the Year. What was your kind of reaction to seeing the awards as they came out and, and maybe to an extent the, the reaction of the Gonzaga fan base yeah. when that all went down? I mean, so my initial reaction was a bit of shock just to not see a single Gonzaga player mm -hmm. in there. Uh, because I, ha when I was making my own list, I think I had three, three mm -hmm. Gonzaga award winners, two of them being the same guy. Cause I had EK for both mm -hmm. player of the year and newcomer. Um, yeah. and my, and then my second thought was thinking about like all the coaches voting for this. And I'm like, what are you doing to the rest of us? Because you have just added the fuel <laughs> to the fire for that locker room, for that mm -hmm. fan base, because we know and as twitter showed us today yeah. just the just the the vitriol that and mm -hmm. just the the chip on the shoulder that comes out when something like this happens whether it be snub or not and i and i'm in agreement with a lot of kind of the conversation yeah. that's out there uh that it should have been a little it should have been different award wise but that man it's like that's that's almost something you don't want to have as extra fuel to the fire going mm -hmm. into Las Vegas for a team that already is playing really well right now. Yeah, exactly. It's not like Gonzaga needed a boost necessarily. They played fantastic last week in those two games against San Francisco and St. Mary's, but it never hurts. Never hurts to get a little boost. And we're kind of on a couple of years in a row now. Last year, there was some some angst about Drew Timmy sharing player of the year with Brandon Pajemski. There was some angst about Anton Watson being left off the teams, which was a misfire by the by the coaches. I absolutely believe that. And this year, I mean, I think a lot of these were mistakes, like not just uh, from a Zag bias perspective, like I don't see how you can make some of the arguments that they made in, in some of these votes. And like, you know, we talked beforehand, I, I understand giving player of the year to a St. Mary's, Mary's player. I do get that. St. Mary's was odd this year in the sense that there wasn't kind of a singularly dominant player. I do think Marcelonis is their best player. And if you want to go best player on the best team, that's the guy you pick. But statistically and just overall impact on his team, I, I think the answer is Graham E.K. But like I said, I also clearly think Graham E.K. should have been at least newcomer of the year. I mean, Mobo was great against Pacific when he had a 30-point, 18-rebound game and was great in a handful of other games, but he averaged less than 11 points a game when he played Gonzaga and St. Mary's and Santa Clara, whereas E.K. averaged 19. In fact, Mobo never scored more than 16 against any of the top three teams in the country. And E.K. or in the conference, excuse me, E.K. averaged 
19. Like to me, there's just not even, it's not even close. Mm -hmm. The impact that EK had for Gonzaga, particularly in those big games compared to Mobo, who I think is a very talented player, but I don't think he holds a candle to Graham EK. And I, I'm, I'm shocked that the coaches voted this way. Yeah. Just like, just, I would have shift just some of those awards around because like, yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think Mobo was the newcomer of the year. Like mm -hmm. I, I mean, easily have EK and Ryan Nemhard ahead of him mm -hmm. um, on that front. But like if made would have made a whole lot of sense to me that he would have been the defensive player yeah. of the year. Like if I'm not going to give him one of those, that would have been the, the one that sticks out to me. Cause like from, from the beginning of the season to, to, to this week, to the end of the season, he has been the cons most consistent defender all year long. He's been, he's the league leader in rebounds. He's one of the league leaders in steals. Like he's, mm -hmm. he fills up a stat box. And especially for a team that doesn't have any other front court presence, really, yeah. like that that made all the difference and we've seen and clearly like usf just looked like a different team when he was playing well mm -hmm. when when mobo was that defensive guy when he's active and everything else like they look different and yes pointing out like that he just wasn't that guy against saint mary's gonzaga mm -hmm. santa clara and that was part of it like it, it did seem like he was missing in those games but mm -hmm. again to that point of like the defensive player of the year, I'd have been fine with that. But yeah, the newcomer one is a little weird for him. Mm -hmm. And the player of the year, like that's another one where it's to for me, I think there's a difference between, and I talked with some people about this over the weekend, is an MVP and a mm -hmm. player of the year. Yeah. And I think if you said who is the most valuable player to their team this year, I I absolutely could have made the strong case for Augustus Marshallonis mm -hmm. because of where that team was when they were playing poorly and how he yeah. was playing when they were playing poorly. And once he figured it out, once he started playing well, the team went with him. Mm -hmm. And so that to me, like, is that sign of an MVP? Yeah. We're talking player of the year. That is strictly on the numbers. Yeah. And yes, there is some impact team impact to that as well. Mm -hmm. But when you combine the two of those things like that, clearly to me was Graham EK, especially once we got deeper into deeper in conference play. Yeah. I, I yeah, I, I, I'm with you hundred percent. I, I think there is an argument for Marshall Onus, depending on how you uh, kind of how you as a voter feel, but for the coaches to have, I mean, pretty clearly snubbed Gonzaga. And I don't, I'm not trying to say there's some conspiracy or some like maliciousness necessarily, but it is, again, it's happened a couple of years in a row. And I, I don't think it's like an anti Gonzaga sentiment as much as maybe it's just like, fatigue almost around the Zags like people wanted to reward San Francisco for having a great year so they give Mobo an award they give Ryan Beatsley an award for freshman of the year which I'm, is not as hotly contested although I think Braden Huff has a pretty strong argument for that as well but it does sort of feel like it's kind of like hey if we have an excuse to not give Gonzaga some of these awards like we're going to do that and, and I, I don't know again I don't think there's some real conversations happening behind the scenes but it does feel like whenever there's an opportunity, they're going to take it. And that's kind of how this felt here. But like you said, all it does is add some bulletin board material. It makes Graham EK pissed off. I know as somebody who follows same areas, you don't want to see Graham EK pissed off. So this is not a great sentiment for the rest of the teams in the conference who are going to let Gonzaga just stew for five more days and then have to face them. Uh, Somebody's going to have to face them, probably San Francisco uh, on Monday. Yeah, this, this is – it sets up well almost for Gonzaga. And I did kind of like have like a half conspiracy, a conspiracy mm -hmm. theory that maybe Mark, you leaned on some of the coaches to not vote for his guys. Yeah. So that he'd have extra motivation for him. But, but yeah, it's like, it just, it just, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't, cause I don't think there's any actual conspiracy or whatnot of like the way this is voted or like the, the Gonzaga fatigue. I don't think it's necessarily there, but I do think mm -hmm. that there's been some, some wanting to reward some of the other teams for yeah. how well some of their guys have played. And I think mm -hmm. that's maybe it's maybe that you can call that Gonzaga fatigue, but it's mm -hmm. like, I think we've also seen some great talent come into this conference and sure. that, and that's the thing. It's like, think about Brandon Pajemski. You look at what he's doing with the warriors this year. It's like, it's hard to argue uh, that that guy was one of the best players in yeah. the WCC last year. And obviously the coaches felt, just mm -hmm. as important, if not mm -hmm. more so in some some cases than uh, Drew Timmy. Right. Well, we're going to get into each individual matchup coming here in the WCC tournament, who we expect the matchups to be against Gonzaga and St. Mary's. All of that coming up after a word from today's sponsor, eBay Motors. Passion, drive, 
patience. That's what brings home the winning trophy. And it's also what helps keep your ride or die alive. And eBay Motors has everything that you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. And with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. Plus, with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your car every time or you get your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that W. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, and eBay's guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. All right, Zach, let's get in to the actual matchups here that we got going on on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, as we get to the portion of the WCC tournament where Gonzaga and St. Mary's will finally tune back in uh, at the start of next week. Uh, the first game, Thursday night, battle between two interim head coaches. <laughs> Pacific and Pepperdine, uh, as I recorded, for those of you who listened to the show, you heard me talk briefly about Leonard Perry getting let go. I recorded that show, published it. Half an hour later, it came out that Lorenzo Romar was getting let go. So I apologize that we didn't have any conversation about that. But two coaches who we kind of thought might be on the hot seat, maybe we're le less sure about Romar. We're fairly confident, at least I was pretty confident that Leonard Perry wasn't going to keep his job uh, after the disastrous season that Pacific had, uh, one of four teams to go winless in conference play. But a little more surprised about Romar, not shocked necessarily, but a little bit more surprised. What was your thought about these two coaches and now having this kind of goofy matchup where we have two teams without head coaches who are going to go up against each other on Thursday? Yeah, I mean, you're right. I think Leonard Perry was a pretty obvious yeah. one, just the way Pacific had played this past season. And la even last year was kind of like, Oh, they actually ended up, I think it was at the five, six seed. So mm -hmm. like they played pretty well in conference, but they couldn't bring anybody back. They couldn't infuse that. They couldn't build off of what mm -hmm. they had a year ago. Um, and yes, part of that was because you had some of those key guys uh, leave, but mm -hmm. that's part of the deal. You have to be able to do that. And unfortunately, uh, Leonard Perry wasn't able to, to keep it rolling. Mm -hmm. And for Romar, I th I think we knew this time was eventually going to come because mm -hmm. it was you can't have that much talent yeah. on these teams and continue to not have results on the court. And would that be the Max Lewis's, the Kessler Edwards, yeah. uh, Ross? Totally like you look, you yeah. just look at over and all these guys like Houston Millet, Javon mm -hmm. Porter. Like there's some legit talent on mm -hmm. these teams, and they just have not been able to turn it into wins. And that's yeah. at the end of the day, like for a head coach and like, yes, it's building your program. And it's been honestly impressive that he was able to recruit as well as he did mm -hmm. to Pepperdine, which I think does show that there's a lot of potential yeah. for that program, but at the, but you have to start winning games and yeah. he just could not do it. So going into this one, going into this game, it's, and this is just going to be kind of, I mean, it's going to be interesting, but I feel like this is Pepperdine's game to yeah. lose. Like they're just more talented. They just have all the pieces. Like the fact that Javon Javon Porter is back, Michael Ajayi playing as well as he is. I know Houston Millette got banged up. I think in the last week of the season, so we'll see if he's how available he is, if he is at all. Um, but I mean, this Pepperdine team should not have much of a problem in this opener uh, because Pacific has just played so poorly. Uh, this year that they're that P Pepperdine would really have to kind of shoot themselves in the foot to lose mm -hmm. this one, which we can't rule out entirely that that might happen. But yes, yes, I agree that Pepperdine is probably your winner here. So the winner of this game will play San Diego. So Pepperdine or Pacific plays San Diego. Whoever wins that game will play Santa Clara. Whoever wins that game will play St. Mary's. It's hard. I don't have a visual right now, so I'm just trying to explain the best I can. The double by tournament is kind of uh, complicated to explain in an audio format. But basically, my question to you, Zach, is this. Do you think the Gales will be playing the Broncos on Monday, right? And if so, do you think Santa Clara, do you think it's going to be chalk? Do you think it's Pepperdine wins, San Diego wins, Santa Clara wins, St. Mary's wins? That's the most chalk way it could go. Or if not, what are some potential like upsets that might happen before we get to that? Uh, whoever St. Mary's plays yeah. on uh, the one, I th I think the interesting matchups, the interesting path here is San Diego because mm -hmm. 
they have i i think the most interesting they kind of almost like the they're so young that they don't know any better mm -hmm. sort of scenario here that yeah. there are no expectations for san diego in this tournament uh which has kind of been what their whole season has been no expectation mm -hmm. and because of the talent that they have because you have a guy like deuce turner yeah. who can light it up on any given night this feels like the sort of event, the sort of setting where we might see him go ballistic yep. in this tournament. And I could ease. I mean, do I think they'll, I think they'll win their first game. I think they'll take care of Pepperdine or Pacific, whoever mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. And then they get Santa Clara who they have already beaten this yep. year and they've beat them in their last matchup. We've seen Santa Clara be very up and down the last few weeks. So I mm -hmm. think that there's some level of potential that Santa Clara could be the upset in yeah. in this tournament and it's san diego that could actually make a run to the semis now i think once they get there they're like they're toast yeah. but um san diego i think is a scary enough team in this tournament early on that could could make a run mm -hmm. in this one i think so too I, that's exactly the pick i was going to make i think san diego beating santa clara really wouldn't shock me i think santa clara is a better team i think if you're st mary's you'd like to see san diego win i think you feel a little bit more confident i know it was against st mary's that deuce turner had like a monster game earlier this year, yeah. right he had like 30 something mm -hmm. yeah so like he's not going to be the most fun target for st mary's fans but i wouldn't be surprised if this happens santa clara has been susceptible to some of these losses uh we, alpha ball has taken a little bit longer to come back from that injury that he had and I, I think that totally could happen. And I think if you're St. Mary's, like you're, you're expecting to play Santa Clara. And if you end up playing San Diego, you're probably feeling a little better about it, but a San Diego team that's gotten a couple wins in a row and is, is heating up heading into a big matchup against you is probably not the most fun team either. I think they're the team, Steve Lavin's team, the the squad, I think I'm most intrigued to watch out of the not top seeds in this tournament. And just thinking about where, what, how we talked about San Diego before the year and yeah. how we're talking about them now, it's like you have to give Steve Lavin and his okay. coaching staffs a lot of credit for where they mm -hmm. are today because a lot of us wrote them off at the mm -hmm. beginning of the year because they were just so young. They, yep. they didn't look like they had the talent. And here they are as the five mm -hmm. seed and in prime position to act and do some damage in this tournament. That said, I will say that Santa Clara to me would still – I would still pick them to advance yeah. to face St. Mary's. I think that's still like the safest bet. Like yeah. they have the more, they have more talent. They're the bigger team. Like yeah. they check all the boxes. It's whether or not they can put it together, which is unfortunately been Santa Clara's trouble, mm -hmm. especially this left back half of the year. Yeah. I've been critical of Steve Lavin in the past, and I'm happy to eat that and acknowledge that this has been a very good coaching job by him to get this program, uh, the spot that they are right now. Zach, looking at the other side of the bracket, we got Portland and LMU. They're going to square off on Friday. The winner is going to play San Francisco on Saturday, and then the winner of that game will, of course, play Gonzaga in that second game or on the other side of that bracket. So starting with Portland and LMU, uh, very intriguing here. Portland kind of moved themselves up in the standings quite a bit in the last few weeks of the season, got hot at the right time. Juan Segorosito had a really nice finish to the year. Tyler Robertson did the things that Tyler Robertson has been doing for the last couple of decades in college basketball. And I think it sets up a, a fun matchup here with, with an LMU team that has obviously dealt with some really significant injury stuff, which has been the huge and unfortunate storyline for Stan Johnson's team. But I wouldn't be surprised to see Portland advance here. I think this is a good matchup, but I also have a hard time, much harder time seeing either of these teams upset San Francisco, whereas I think it's much more likely that Santa Clara might get upset. That's just my read on it, at least. Yeah, I'd agree with that because you're right. It's like Portland is starting to play much better of the last few last couple of weeks, last few mm -hmm. weeks. And LMU just has been so devastated by injuries yeah. that it's almost a little unfair to kind of mm -hmm. think about like just what they're capable of doing because they just don't have yeah. almost any of their key pieces. I mean, you think like Kelly Lyle Pepe is still out. Like mm -hmm. Dom Harris is still kind of in and out of the lineup. Yeah. You, you don't have um, Rick Asanza. The fact that he's been out as long as he has, and we saw how critical he was yeah. a year ago for that squad. I mean, this team is just, they can't, they can't stay healthy long mm -hmm. enough to actually get something rolling. And so, yeah, Portland, to me is the safe pick to move on. And then you're right. I don't see either of these teams beating USF. USF, like Gonzaga and St. Mary's, are the only other team who's just cleaned house yeah. on every one fifth or below. Like they yeah. were, a, they I think it was a perfect, what, that's 
one, two, three, four, eight, and oh against those teams. So like yep. that, they also understand how to win against those squads. Um, unlike Santa Clara, who's had a couple of those hiccups, San Diego, and then also Portland, mm -hmm. USF will handle business. I don't expect them to really falter, even though they did have a rough week this past we but really rough past couple of weeks because yeah. they lost to St. Mary's, they lost to Gonzaga, they lost to Santa Clara. So yeah. even they are struggling a little bit more, but again, it's who did they struggle against? It's like one seed, two seed, four seed. Yeah. They clean house on everybody else. And so I'm not concerned about the Dons until, until we get to the semis. Well, and that's, that, that's the next point is like, I, I see St. Mary's being able to advance past Santa Clara or San Diego. Not, I don't want to say easily, but I, they're going to be favored there. And I kind of see the same on the other side. And for most of the season, the conversation was not, oh, Gonzaga is clearly going to make it to the WCC tournament championship like they always do. Like it seemed more tenuous, like they might not get there. But now they have a potential matchup. If they're not playing San Francisco, they're certainly going to advance. I don't think I mean, they've absolutely destroyed both LMU and Portland this year. Uh, but if they play San Francisco for the third time, I don't know. I mean, they they struggled against them the first time at home. They struggled in the first half against them on the road and then crushed them in that second half. San Francisco has yet to find anything remotely resembling an answer to Graham E.K. They have no idea how to stop him. And I think Chris Gerlison's a fantastic coach and they've tried so many things and they just don't have the horses to stop him. I think that it, there's very few situations where Gonzaga and St. Mary's are not playing in that championship. Do you see what are the if it if it weren't to happen, what would it be because of, or, or how likely do you think it is that that's going to be our championship again in the WCC? I think the chances that it's not Gonzaga St. Mary's is probably less than 10 yeah. percent that it's that it's not that matchup one more time. But mm -hmm. if if there were a scenario in which it does happen, it feels like USF is going to have to hit about 15 threes yep. in that game to have a shot against Gonzaga again, to the point of like, you have to counteract Graham EK in some mm -hmm. way, shape or form. And because they haven't been able to do that defensively, they haven't been able to slow him down in the post. Yeah. You have to make that up on the perimeter mm -hmm. also because we haven't seen it come from Jonathan Mobo in the yeah. two matchups. So you're going to need the likes of Marcus Williams. You're going to need Ryan Beasley. You're going mm -hmm. to need, uh, Malik Thomas Malik to Thomas. really come up and step through. And, and the guy, I still am like, I'm waiting for him to break out because the the skill set is all there. I'm waiting for Mike Shara jumps to just break through and, and understand like he is just bigger than anyone that's going to guard him <laughs> and he can just shoot over the top of anybody. Um, I'm just waiting for that to happen. And, and that's it. We just haven't seen it to this point. Maybe it finally does in Vegas. I don't wouldn't expect that, mm -hmm. but we've seen Malik Thomas go off. We've seen Marcus Williams go off. We've seen Ryan Beasley go off. If yeah. if a combination of those guys start to play well and hell, like, like we need if Duido Newberry also hits a couple of threes as well, and we've seen him do that early in the year. USF does have a shot, but they've got to have maybe they've got to have their best offensive night of the year to have a shot. Well, we're thinking Zags versus Gales is the likely outcome in the WCC championship. So what I want to do now is talk about what Gonzaga needs to do to win that championship. How can St. Mary's potentially even the score? We're also going to talk about some of the implications of this game in terms of seeding for both squads in the NCAA tournament. All of that coming up. After a word from today's sponsor, Amazon Fire TV. Folks, Fire TV is your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's March Madness or opening weekend for baseball, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. I have Amazon Fire Sticks in my house on literally every single TV because I love the layout and the user experience. The remote is handy and even has little buttons that take you directly to Prime or Netflix or Disney Plus or Hulu. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free. And that includes all of us at Locked On. It also includes most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels let you dive into all the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep you up to date on the latest in the world of sports. From March Madness, NBA, MLB, and everything else. So check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. To learn more, visit Amazon.com slash locked on Fire TV. All right, Zach, closing out the show. 
talking about the matchup that we're all expecting to see, that we're all hoping to see, that we're all anxiously anticipating Gonzaga St. Mary's round three WCC championship. If that is the matchup, let's talk about some keys to the game. Because what we saw from Gonzaga on Saturday was effectively exploiting the fact that Joshua Jefferson was not on the floor for the Gales. I don't think that was the entirety of the the discrepancy between the two scores in Spokane and in Moraga, but it had a big impact. We saw Gonzaga be more willing to not defend Mason Forbes. I guess that's the best way to put it. Uh, And that kind of created some offensive issues for Randy Bennett's team. I think they were more limited defensively. Anton Watson didn't have a particularly great offensive game. I thought he played great defensively, but Graham E.K. just did what Graham E.K. does and just went absolutely insane. Ryan Nembhard's ability to gash the defense of St. Mary's and get where he wanted and get to those spots and get his his little floater or his passes was, I mean, we haven't seen a team do that to St. Mary's very often. So my question to you is what can they do? St. Mary's, I mean, differently, what adjustments can they make to make this game not go the same way that it went in Moraga and certainly not go the same way that it went last year in the WCC tournament? What is St. Mary's, what adjustments can they make with the absence of Joshua Jefferson to potentially pull off a win here? So I think what, at least like a few things that I think that this team has to be able to do is get, Augustus Marshallon is actually engaged in mm-hmm. in a lot more often on the offensive end, not just like him dishing it out and whatnot. He needs yeah. to be an active shooter. And I think that's what you actually we need to see from him because he only took six shots in the game against mm-hmm. Gonzaga on Saturday. That's not going to be good enough, especially when you looked over at his backcourt mate, um, mm-hmm. Ada Mahaney at, was six for 19 from the floor. And that's he became a volume shooter. And Gonzaga forced mm-hmm. him to become a volume shooter. And that is not the way that this team is going to be able to win this ball game. Mm-hmm. Also, I think you need to get, you do need to get a little bit more from, from the bench. Like you do need Luke Barrett to, I think, be a little bit more assertive because it looked like there were a few times where he kind of second guessed that three point shot. And, and he passed up. Tried, a lot of shots. <laughs> yeah. And that's something like usually that he's not a guy who lacks in confidence. So mm-hmm. like, I think he needs to be able to say like, I need to take this shot. I'm going to do that because we saw, as you mentioned, that Gonzaga was able to almost play four on five and not guard mm-hmm. Mason Forbes anywhere past 10 feet away from the basket. Mm-hmm. So that's something you do have to have, or you need Mason Forbes to hit like maybe one three just to kind of keep Gonzaga honest on that front. Yeah. The other thing, and it it didn't happen on Saturday, but it's still a concern, is the foul trouble for May, uh, Mitchell Saxon. Mm-hmm. Because at the very least, like he provides some level of of not protection because like, I feel like he had, because we saw what Graham EK did and like, it didn't seem to matter if Saxon was there or not. Right. But if he gets in foul trouble early, they're not deep right now. Mm-hmm. You don't have a Joshua Jefferson. You don't, we don't know what the condition of Harry Wessels is. Mm-hmm. And if he's unavailable as well, like that becomes a very, very small St. Mary's team. And, yeah. and then it's like, and we've seen what, uh, Grammy K will do against smaller teams. He'll just shoot over the top of them. He'll bully them. Yep. And especially yes, as we talked earlier in the show, just he has the extra chip on his shoulder. He did not get mm-hmm. player of the year. <laughs> he mm-hmm. might actually use that as, as motivation as well in this one. So I think St. Mary's has to, to an, I don't want to say play a perfect game, but they have a, have a lot of things go well yeah. for them. I think they have to also have to do a better job of keeping Ryan Emard easier said than done out mm-hmm. of the key. You yeah. can't let him dictate the offense as much as he has in yeah. both of the matchups because he's played really well in the game in Spokane and in the game in Moraga because they've kind of done the job that they need to do on Nolan Hickman. Mm-hmm. They've done, they did a much better job um, on Anton Watson yeah. on the offensive end. So like they're, they've done some things well in the last matchup, but we saw that separation. St. Mary's just could not get anything going offensively. And so they need, I think, Augustus Marshallonis to step up and be more assertive. They need, I think, Aiden Mahaney to be a little bit more selective on the shots he's taking. And because there were some poor mm-hmm. forced shots in there, Luke Barrett needs to be more aggressive. Uh, and I, th- those are just some of the things, because I do think a lot of things have to go well for St. Mary's to win that one. Uh, because again, we saw what happened in Vegas a year ago. Again, totally different team. That's a Julian Strother, <laughs> Drew Timmy, Gonzaga yeah. team. Uh, but this is still a very motivated and hungry Gonzaga team who's looking at their seating now because they're in. We know mm-hmm. they're solidly into the t- tournament. We know St. Mary's is solidly, solidly into the tournament. A little bit of a bet- bragging rights game. Mm-hmm. And we know that 
this Gonzaga team is just going to, they're going to be ready. It's a matter of whether or not St. Mary's is going to be able to keep up with them. It's so funny. So much of the conversation this season has been about how the, the WCC title game was going to be like win or go home. Like the, there was so much conversation about, well, if Gonzaga doesn't win in Vegas, if St. Mary's doesn't win in Vegas. And now here we are in Vegas or about to be in Vegas. And both these teams are in the field. Like, it's like we're, we're, we're no longer having that conversation. They have done enough. Uh, I'm, you know, in my mind, just without question, really to, to be in the field, regardless of how this thing goes, I guess, barring maybe like if Pacific went on a huge run and then upset St. Mary's, I don't know, maybe that would impact St. Mary's enough to be on the bubble, but I don't really think so. I think both these teams, especially if they're in that championship game, are very safe in terms of making the field. But it does impact seeding. And it feels to me like whatever team doesn't win this game could end up being on that dreaded 8-9 line where you end up having to play a one seed in the second round and you're going to get matched with like UConn or Purdue and it's going to be a lot more difficult to advance. Where do you, you know, from from combing Lenardi's brackets and other brackets, like kind of what is your sense for – what this, assuming this is the matchup, of course, what the winner or loss year for these teams will do for them uh, when selection Sunday rolls around. I mean, right now you see like Gonzaga has been hovering on that seven, six line. Yeah. St. Mary's has been right about the same spot. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if a win against each other moves the needle all that yeah. much at this stage. Cause it feels weird. like that. Now I, I did say that there is a possibility. I think if St. Mary's had won out, mm-hmm. lot, had won the Gonzaga game, won, mm-hmm. wins out in Vegas, that they could have maybe jumped to a five line, yeah. that they could have jumped up to that. But with the loss on Saturday, uh, last Saturday, mm-hmm. I don't think that's possible. I think that they're kind of stuck at at, at least at a high end, a six mm-hmm. seat. They, but with a loss, maybe they drop to an eight. It does feel like they're kind of like stuck at that seven line. I yeah. don't, I think that's going to be about where they are. I yeah. think Gonzaga, that's their, that's their floor as well as that mm-hmm. seven line. But I, mm-hmm. if they, if St. Mary's wins, I think they're going to be solidly at that six. Mm-hmm. If Gonzaga wins, I think that's about where they'll be as well. I just don't see the committees looking at these two teams and the totality and moving them up also just because we know that the power conferences are going to have enough like mm-hmm. of those teams who are hovering at that seven, eight, yep. six line who are going to get another quad one win just because of their, just because of their conference mm-hmm. and they'll move up and probably leapfrog mm-hmm. Gonzaga or St. Mary's. Now again, another quad one win, who knows, maybe it does, but I think they're going to be right on that six, seven line. Yeah. And that's where both of them are. I think, I mean, my prediction was almost exactly what you said, that the winner gets a six seed, the loser gets a seven seed. Like there's going to be other factors, like you said, what other teams do certainly has an impact on this, but that's kind of where I'm at. I think both these teams are right in that same spot. And I think we're going to see them. I don't think a win here moves the needle a ton. I don't think a loss, unless flips, I don't think a loss drops either of them all that much. So I think they're both going to probably kind of hover in that six, seven spot. And honestly, like looking at as much as I've followed college basketball this year, that feels about right. I think both teams are a little bit more talented than like the comparable seven seeds, but their resumes don't quite stand up. Obviously, St. Mary's had those early season losses. Uh, Gonzaga didn't pick up the wins they needed to pick up. So I feel like six, seven feels about right for both teams, even if I think they're like, they're the kind of six, seven seed that three seeds are going to be a little sweaty about. Like they're not going to want to face them in that second round, but I think that that is probably where they deserve to be. Zach, Thank you so much, as always, for coming on the show, for bringing your expertise, for helping us preview this WCC tournament. We got so much fun basketball still to be played this year, not only in the WCC, but of course, as these two teams get into the NCAA tournament as well. I appreciate you taking the time and looking forward to watching these two teams hopefully battle it out next week. Thanks for having me, Andy.